catch me here at the intersection to the entire world. Ezekiel 5.5 said that Jerusalem is the center of the earth, and he placed all other nations around her. Well, this is the location here in the old city of Jerusalem, where the Christian quarter meets at an intersection with the Jewish quarter, and behind me, the Muslim quarter. The Armenian quarter is another part of the city, but these three sections of the old city say so much to us as we begin this documentary talking about God's plan for his church, his bride, God's plan for Christians. And we're gonna go through this entire documentary and explain it along the way. But Jerusalem was the location where the church actually began. Now this is of course the site where Christ would have been crucified, buried and resurrected. And the church would go, and we'll go to that location in just a moment, uh, where they believe the resurrection took place. And of course, for those Jewish believers in the first century of the church, that's where they would gather every Sunday to celebrate Resurrection Sunday. This particular location speaks of the three members of the human family. The Bible tells us there are Jews, Gentiles, and Christians. In the first 2,000 years of human history, from Genesis 1 to Genesis 12, from Adam to Abraham, there were only Gentiles on the face of the earth. Now this is true because when God created Adam and Eve, they were Gentiles. And then Abraham came from Ur of the Chaldees, which is located in modern day Iraq. And from that location, the Lord led him up into the land of promise, the land of Israel. Abraham was called a Hebrew. His grandson Jacob was called Israel, and his great-grandson Judah was called a Jew. And that began the second strand of the human family, the Jewish people. That would be from Genesis chapter 12 to Acts chapter 1. And indeed, that would be a period of time between Abraham and the apostles. In Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, and we're going to go to the site in just a moment where the day of Pentecost actually took place. From the day of Pentecost, and that would be the times of the apostles, Acts chapter 2, all the way over to Revelation. You're looking at a period of time of almost 2,000 years from the apostles to Antichrist. The third member of the human family would come into existence, and that would be Christians. So this location here in the old city of Jerusalem speaks exactly to the point that I'm trying to bring to your attention. You have the Christian quarter, and right around that corner would be the Holy Sepulcher. You have the Jewish quarter right up this beautiful little alley, and behind me you have the Arab quarter, the intersection of the entire world. Now in this documentary, we'll tell you the story of how the church began here in Jerusalem. And then the church would make a westward movement into Asia Minor. There we'll go to the seven churches of the book of Revelation, chapters two and three. That will then bring us to a place where we see the messages from Jesus Christ to the churches, explaining what's gonna happen during the Christian period, during the church age, but also into the future as well. I'm so glad that you could join us on our journey here in the Middle East as I tell you the story of God's plan for the church, past, present, and future. caught me taking a moment of rest here on the southern steps of the Temple Mount. These steps actually date back 2,000 years. Jesus Christ would have walked up these steps because this was the entrance into the Temple Mount area. In fact, if you remember in Luke, when Jesus was 12 years of age, he was left behind by his mom and dad as they went back to Nazareth. But when they came and found him, he was talking with the doctors, the lawyers. He was teaching them even at 12 years of age and much wisdom Jesus had even at that time as they were asking him many questions. Now these steps are the way that you would enter the Temple Mount and do whatever activities you're gonna do, sacrificial activities, worship, whatever. And then you would come out the Hulda gates to make your way back out of the Temple Mount area complex and then onto your home, wherever you may be going. 
These are very important steps. This is the area of the southern steps of the Temple Mount. Down below us would be the city of David, which is the original city that King David captured. In 2 Samuel chapter 5, it was a Jebusite stronghold. He captured that city and he made it the political capital of the Jewish people. Soon after that, he went and got the Ark of the Covenant from Kiryat Yarim. He brought it here to the same location and he then made it the spiritual capital of the Jewish people. That's 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 7, the Davidic Covenant, it gives us the promise, a promise in particular to the Jewish people that this Temple Mount, the sacred piece of real estate to the Jewish people, would be the location where the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would rule and reign forever. Psalm 132 verses 13 and 14 says, I have chosen Jerusalem to dwell among my people forever. We're on the southern steps of the Temple Mount complex. And I'd like to take a moment to take you over here and show you where the original city of Jerusalem was, but then talk about the day of Pentecost, which is one of those Jewish feasts that was fulfilled just exactly like Jesus Christ said when the Holy Spirit came upon the new Jewish believers here in the city of Jerusalem. Come along with me. The camera has been showing you a mikvah. Now that's a ritual bath. The Jewish people, would they would enter the Temple Mount area, would take a mikvah, purify themselves, and then go up onto the Temple Mount. What makes it a mikvah are the seven steps that lead down into it. And the water that would be used in that mikvah had to be living water. That's the phrase they used. It had to be running water or rainwater. It could not be stagnant water. Behind me, you'll hear the buses on the road, and you'll see a couple of buses as we look down off of the southern steps of the Temple Mount. Where those two very colorful buses are, behind them would be the 10 acres of the city of David. That was the original city of Jerusalem, the Jebusite stronghold that King David captured with his mighty men and established as the political capital of the Jewish people. And then when he brought the ark down, it was the spiritual capital of the Jewish people as well. When you get to the passage of scripture in Acts chapter two, you'll see that's the record of the day of Pentecost. After the death of Jesus Christ, his resurrection, he died on Passover, resurrected on first fruits. And then the promise that he had given in John 16, I have to go, but when I go, I will send the spirit of truth, the comforter, the Holy Spirit to each and every one of you. Well, that was 10 days after Christ ascended into the heavenlies. And because it was the feast of Pentecost, which is one of those pilgrim feast when all the Jews were to go to Jerusalem. The text tells us in Acts 2, 5 that Jews from all over the world were gathered in the city of Jerusalem for the feast of Pentecost. Peter preached that day and a number of Jewish believers came to know Christ as Lord and Savior. Acts chapter 2 tells us it was about 3,000 who came to know Christ and they were baptized. That mikvah right there would have been the supply of water for the baptismal activities on the day of Pentecost some 2,000 years ago. Now you only see one mikvah here in this complex, but throughout the entire area, this archeological dig, there are a number of mikvahs where the baptisms took place on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached here at this special time. And this was the time that the church was brought into existence. God took two people, Gentiles and Jews, and they were at enmity with each other. There was a wall of petition between them. With the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he took that wall out and made two people, one people, Christians. Three members of the human family, Gentiles, Jews, and Christians all come to know Christ as Lord and Savior, they become Christians. Now, of course, on the day of Pentecost, and for about the first 20 years of the church, 
It was simply Jewish believers that came to know Christ. Acts chapter 10, when Peter also went up to Caesarea and met with Cornelius the centurion, he led him to the Lord and then the Gentile world was brought together with the Jewish people to form that one body, the church, the bride of Christ, Christians. All of it beginning right here on the day of Pentecost some 2,000 years ago. Come from the intersection of the world, located there in the old city of Jerusalem, where the four quarters combine. The Muslim quarter, the Armenian quarter, the Christian quarter, and the Jewish quarter. We've come here to the Mount of Olives. This was a special location in the life of Jesus Christ. In fact, he was crucified here on the Mount of Olives. He was buried in a cave on the Mount of Olives, and then he resurrected and went into the heavenlies from here at this particular place. After his resurrection, he went to the Galilee with about 500 people, and there for 40 days he taught them, according to Acts chapter 1, things pertaining to the kingdom. When they returned to Jerusalem, some of those who had been traveling with him asked if he was ready to set up his kingdom at that time. He said, no, I'm not. And they said, well, when will you do that? And he then said, only my father knows that. And in fact, Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14 says, The Ancient of Days, God the Father, will give the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, His dominion, His kingdom, when He sees Jesus Christ returning to this spot, coming in the clouds. That's Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 4. Well, at this point in time, Christ would ascend into the heavenlies. In fact, those who had been following him watched him as he went up. And the text in Acts 1 says there were two men in white apparel, not angels. Those are men, two men in white apparel, who said, why stand you here gazing into heaven as he's gone, so he's going to come again another day. Jesus Christ will indeed come to this location. Prior to his leaving this particular spot, Mount of Olives in the city of Jerusalem, he told his disciples to wait 10 days, the power would come upon them, and then they were to go forth and spread the gospel of the kingdom, leading people to him as their savior, and of course the establishment of the church. Uh, the manifestation of the church takes place from this location because since Christ was crucified on the Mount of Olives, buried and resurrected on the Mount of Olives, that first church location would be that site where he rose from the dead from so they could every Sunday meet on Resurrection Sunday and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But it was also from here Peter preached and he saw 3,000 souls, Jewish souls, come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. The Gentiles would have the opportunity to receive Christ about 20 years later, Acts chapter 10, when Peter also, at that point in time, went into Caesarea and met with Cornelius, the centurion from Rome, and he led him to Jesus Christ, combining those two peoples, the Jews and the Gentiles, who would become Christians, the church, the bride of Christ. It's going to be to this location that he's going to return, but we have much to see, many miles to travel before we get back to the time that he comes back to this spot. We come here to the church Patra Nostra, which means our father, and it's the location where actually the first church for the Jewish believers in Jerusalem after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They would have come to this location to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. And we're going to the cave where he was buried, resurrected, and that first church was started. This is down into the cave where the first church here in Jerusalem and the Jewish believers would have gathered on Sunday, uh, the first day of the week, for the purpose of being able to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Eliona was the name of the church at that time, dating from the time of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what was actually taking place here is that the church was celebrating when Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. I've got to remind you that Christ was crucified on the Mount of Olives at a location near that altar 
without the gate, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 10. Uh, but this would be the celebration location for the resurrection of Christ. And every Sunday they would meet here. Here's where the church was actually established. And from here it started making a westward move over into Asia Minor. Let's go to that location in Asia Minor now. As we begin our journey through Asia Minor and the seven churches of the book of Revelation, Revelation chapters 2 and 3, we start out here in Istanbul. Istanbul itself has a wonderful history, dating back to the time during the Byzantine Empire when it was called the Sancium. And then in 300 when Constantine became the Emperor of Rome, he came here and he established Constantinople, naming this city after himself and continuing to expand his empire. In 1453, the Turks came in, they captured the city, and they made it an Islamic city. And they changed the name of the city to Istanbul. In the background, you see Hagia Sophia, the Holy Wisdom. It was the first church built in this area. Constantine had built the church in the 300s for the purpose of continuing to spread what he called Christianity. Remember, after the edict at Milan, everybody would become a Christian who was baptized. But this is a perfect place in which we can explain what happened in Asia Minor. Acts chapter 19, and we'll see when we're at Ephesus, how Paul used that base to reach every single person in Asia Minor. Not all of them became Christians, but every one of them heard the gospel message. But as the church started to fade from the command and the direction and the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ, what ultimately happened that the church faded into the background and the Islamic faith came forward. As I take a turn to the other direction from where Hagia Sophia is located, you'll see the Blue Mosque, which represents uh, that period of the Islamic Empire. In fact, Islam spread here, moving to the west, and it ended up being stopped here in Turkey. There are many believe that the Islamic faith will continue to spread from Turkey one day. I would happen to be one of those that believe that's exactly what is going to happen. But at this particular location, we see the church, we see Islam, Hagia Sophia, and we also see the Blue Mosque, one of the largest mosques in all of the Islamic world. From here, we're going to visit the seven churches of Asia Minor. We'll be going to Ephesus first. We'd love to have you come and go along with us. As we begin our journey now through the visits to the seven churches of Asia Minor, we come here first to the church at Ephesus. The Apostle Paul established this church, Acts chapter 19, when he came to this area in missionary journeys for the purpose of winning people to Christ. In fact, ultimately, we can read in Acts 19 and verse 10 that at the time Paul was ministering for about a two-year period of time here in Ephesus, everybody in Asia Minor heard the gospel. That does not mean they all came to know Christ as Lord and Savior, but everybody did have an opportunity to hear the gospel. You can see behind me the remains of the library, which was one of the most significant buildings in the ancient biblical city of Ephesus. At this time, Ephesus, in the time when Paul would have been here for his ministry, at this time in history, Ephesus was the second most important city in the Roman Empire, second only to Rome, Italy. Ephesus was a seaport city, 
Uh, no evidence of that today because all the silt has come in and filled up the harbor area. But from Ephesus, Paul would preach, the gospel would go out, and would continue making this westward movement from here on to Italy, to Rome, and then around the rest of the world. Ephesus was the location where Alexander the Great came, and he built a beautiful theater, a Colosseum. We'll be at that location momentarily, and we'll talk about what happened there when Paul preached in that location. The Apostle John was a pastor here in Ephesus. Now, Paul started the church. John comes along in the 90s, in the first century, uh, to continue the ministry and be pastor of the church here at Ephesus. It was from this location uh, that the Roman ruler at that time, Domitian, would send John out to the Isle of Patmos, put him under house arrest, because as it says in Revelation 1, John's powerful preaching and his testimony so bothered the Roman emperor, the highest ranking leader in the world at that time, that he put John on the Isle of Patmos. This is the location when John was released from the Isle of Patmos, he would come back with those letters to the seven churches and start from here to do his circuit writing ministry uh, to the other six churches here in Asia Minor. This was a very specific location, key to the understanding of Christianity, the spread of Christianity in the first century, and the ministry of John the Revelator, the author, the human author of the book of Revelation. We'll walk through the city, you'll see some of the sites, and along the way we'll talk about the significance of those letters. There were seven letters to seven churches, and I'm going to break them down into three specific important parts of each of the letters. But just enjoy as we journey through down from the upper city of Ephesus to the lower city, here in this most unique city in all the world today, because this is the greatest archaeological remains of any place in the world. But in the days of Paul and John, very significant in the Roman Empire and the spread of the gospel. You can see in front of us the crowds of the people who are visiting the archaeological remains here in Ephesus. Many of the cruise ships will dock in Akusadasi, that's a major port city, especially for cruise ships coming out of, well, Italy, out of Greece, and everybody wants to have this a part of their itinerary. They come here, they spend a day on a side journey, but you can understand, can you see all that's here, how significant this is, and the part of what is unfolding in our world at the time of Peter, Paul, John, all the apostles. I stop on the way down to the library, the remains of the library here in Ephesus 2,000 years ago. And behind me you'll see the scaffolding. These are archaeologists working at continually bringing to the attention of the world the archaeological remains in this particular city. In fact, they tell me only 10% of all of Ephesus dating back to the times of the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John. Only 10% of those archaeological remains are visible today. Ongoing work to develop this site, an exciting archaeological site, a site that, of course, you would want to be able to visit sometime in your lifetime. As we look at the messages to each of the churches in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation, you'll see there are some similarities. Each of the letters begins the message by saying, unto the angel of the church. It's not necessarily talking about the pastor. In fact, I don't believe it's talking about the pastor at all. The word is angelos in Greek, which of course is translated angel, sometimes translated messenger but for sure some type of a heavenly messenger at each of the seven churches of Asia Minor. In addition to that similarity, there will be a characteristic of Jesus Christ, 
Jesus will say in each of the letters, I know thy works. In five of the seven letters, he says, but yet I have somewhat against you. Only to the church in Smyrna and Philadelphia does he not make this condemnation. Those two churches will be what the Lord exhorts all of the other churches to be like in this time of the last words of Jesus Christ to the church here on the earth and the plan that he has for the church. To those churches that he makes condemnation, he tells them they must repent. In other words, turn around and go the other way or else he will remove their light, their candlestick. He also concludes each of the letters with, he that hath an ear, let him hear. He wants the church to hear what he's saying. And finally, he says, and to those who are overcomers. Now, an overcomer, according to 1 John 5, verse 4, is someone who comes to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And he'll make a prophetic promise to each of those churches in the messages that he sends to them. As we look down this avenue from the upper city to the lower city of Ephesus, you see in the background the remains of the library, one of the most significant libraries in all of time, but for sure in the time of the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John. We'll go down there in just a few moments and I'll make a couple of more statements about what the Lord was saying to the church in Ephesus. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but for each of the letters, there's a personal application. In other words, it's talking about one of the characteristics of Jesus Christ, which would be found in Revelation chapter 1. And then there's a practical exhortation. He's exhorting these churches, even Smyrna and Philadelphia, the two churches he had no condemnation of. He's exhorting the churches to move out and do what he wants the church to do, not only in the time that we see represented here by the remains of the church at Ephesus, but throughout church history and even today until Jesus Christ should come back. And finally, there's a prophetic presentation, a promise of what he is going to do for the church. Very, very practical information in each of the letters as we look at his personal application, his practical exhortation, and his prophetic presentation. standing here next to this sarcophagus. This is an indication that somebody has died. Well, the church at Ephesus is dead now, but the remains of the church at Ephesus and the city of Ephesus, the location of the ministry of the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John, is alive. You can see all the travelers, the world pilgrims, that are making their way here to these archaeological remains. I'm not quite sure how much they understand from a biblical perspective but from an archaeological historic perspective, very significant. I mentioned that each of the churches would have a personal application and a practical exhortation. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. The church here at Ephesus received this word from Jesus Christ, the one who held the seven stars in his hands walking among the seven golden candlesticks. Well, the seven stars would be the leaders, the angels of the seven churches. And of course, as you look at the interpretation in chapter 1 and verse 20 of those two apocalyptic phrases, the seven golden candlesticks would be the seven churches of Asia Minor. And so that was the personal application. The practical exhortation can be found in chapter 2 of the book of Revelation between verses 1 and 7. The Lord honors the church at Ephesus. They were faithful. They were true to what he told them to do. They would recognize false apostles and point them out. But right there in the middle of that first letter in chapter 2 of Revelation, the Lord says, I know thy works, but nevertheless, I have somewhat against you. And then he makes the statement, you and the church at Ephesus have left your first love. They were loveless. He exhorts them, remember how it was when you first fell in love with Jesus Christ. 
and then repeat those things that you did. You need to repent. Repent means to go in in one direction, turn around and go in the other direction, or else I will remove your candlestick, remove your influence here in Asia Minor, where the Apostle Paul had such a great ministry, getting the gospel message out to every person living in Asia Minor. That would be the personal application and the practical exhortation of what the Lord wants the church, not only in John's day, but today, to pay close attention to. Fall back in love with Jesus Christ. Don't be a loveless church. Don't be a loveless Christian. That's the message from here in Ephesus. This is the port entrance to the city of Ephesus. Behind me, you will see the avenue leading down to the port itself. There's no port there today because the silt has filled in all of that area. It was a port city, a thriving port city, one of the major port cities in the time of the Apostle Paul. Those arriving in Ephesus would have come this way into the city. One of the reasons that Paul set up his time of study with a small group of Jewish people for about a three month period of time. They came to an end and then went to the school of Tyrannus and there he served and taught and had an opportunity to communicate the gospel for about a two year period of time. It was out of this area that the gospel went forth to all of Asia Minor. Now people entering, coming off their ships, arriving here in Ephesus would make their way up this avenue and the sight that they would see would be this unbelievable, unbelievable theater originally built by Alexander the Great. That's where Demetrius, the silversmith, attacked Paul because Paul's ministry had been so effective. Not far from here, the Temple of Diana. That was the focus. The silversmith Demetrius got very upset about the fact that those items that he was making as a silversmith, uh, the statues, uh, the replicas of the multi-breasted Diana, were not being sold because Paul had been so effective in his ministry. And at that point in time, the people were even bringing their books of idolatry and burning them. A revival did break out among many people here in Ephesus. And the theater behind us, the location of the very intense persecution of the Apostle Paul. We've traveled for about an hour up the Aegean coastline from Ephesus here to the modern day town of Izmir. And right here in the center of Izmir, this archeological site of the original city of Smyrna at the time of the Apostle Paul and also at the time of the Apostle John who wrote the book of Revelation and was told by the Lord to deliver the messages to the seven churches. He went to the church at Ephesus where he pastored and then he started moving up north coming along the Aegean coastline uh, to the location of Smyrna. Smyrna, like Ephesus, was a port city, but today it remains a port city, a very, very extensive port city here in the modern day state of Turkey. You'll hear the noises of the city around us because we're right in the center of Izmir, the modern day town in Turkey. But we come back 2,000 years to Smyrna. There was a church here and John was told to carry a message from Jesus Christ to this particular church. It was a very rich community in the time of John, but indeed the church was very poor. In fact, they're known for having stood true to the faith and having to suffer because of that fact. The personal application was Jesus Christ said he was the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. He also added he was the one that was alive, dead, and now stood before all the world as resurrected from the dead. This is the personal application given to the church here at Smyrna. And why it's so appropriate is the church at Smyrna is known as the long-suffering church. They would be faithful to the Lord, 
but they would come in contact with those who would want to persecute them. In fact, the message there in the letter to the church at Smyrna was that you're going to be thrown in jail by Satan, but it'll be for a short period of time. You'll have to face tribulation, not the tribulation of the book of Revelation that's talked about in chapters 4 to 19, but a time of trouble. It says 10 days will be all that you'll have to face of that particular tribulation or that time of trouble. He gave them a promise and the promise would be they'll not taste of the second death, but some might be killed here in Smyrna. They would be the long-suffering church, a very important church as we continue reading and discussing and understanding the messages that Jesus Christ gives to one of the seven churches of Asia Minor. As John would continue his journey traveling from church to church in Asia Minor, starting there in Ephesus, making his way to Smyrna, he would come here into Pergamos. Your view from my vantage point is the Greek theater. Remember, Alexander the Great would have established this community called Pergamos, the Greek theater evidence of that period of time. We're talking about 95 A.D. when John received the revelation from God the Father, who then gave it to Jesus, who then delegated an angel to give it to John. And with that command to take the messages to the seven churches, John comes here into Pergamos. This is a very wealthy city, but it was a wicked city. It was a city of multiplicity of gods. And in fact, it was referred to as the throne or the seat of Satan. And that is, of course, because of the fact of all the gods that were worshipped here. The Greek gods, Greek mythology, which would have been prevalent in this particular city. But we're standing here in the Acropolis, our vantage point, of course, down to that beautiful Greek theater. And here in the Acropolis, we see what would be the temple of Trajan. This was the first temple dedicated to the worship of the Roman leaders from the Greek period of time to the Roman Empire. And here these Roman leaders, the Roman emperors, would not only be worshipped, they would be deified by the people. But in addition to that, they were given a religious title. We'll go on the other side and you can see where I'm talking about. In a moment, we'll make our way down the slopes from the Acropolis here in Pergamos to the location of the altar of Zeus. He was the father of all the Greek mythical gods. But first, this temple dedicated to the Roman emperors. And this would be the temple of Trajan. This is the location where the Roman emperors, as I said, would have been deified and they would receive a title. They had a political title, that would be Caesar. And then they would have a religious title, which would be Pontifus Maximus. You can see that the tourist people come to this location for the purpose of being able to see all that dates back 2,000 years to the time of that church here in Pergamos. But that title uh, for the Roman emperors, as they were deified, Pontifus Maximus, meaning the major keeper of the bridge would be that evolution of the title and leadership role in the church all the way to the city of Rome. Not long after they were given the title of Pontifus Maximus, it was too long a title so they shortened it to Pontiff, ultimately making it much shorter to the term Pope. Pergamus would become the destination of that mother-son cult that was established some 4,500 years ago in Babylon. That would be Genesis chapter 11 and verse 4, when Nimrod, the great-grandson of Noah, said, let us build us a tower whose top may reach into heaven. That was the beginning of the mother-son cult. Nimrod had a wife named Semiramis. Now, they had a son named Tammuz. Semiramis in Jeremiah chapters 7 and 44 is referred to as the queen of heaven. 
Tammuz was worshipped in the temple, Ezekiel chapter 8, uh, by the convent of virgins that were in the temple when it was being desecrated before the Spirit of the Lord lifted up off of the mercy seat and left the area of the temple in Jerusalem. As you travel and watch the history, the Babylonian Empire fell in 539 B.C. And that mother-son cult had started to spread all across the countryside from Babylon out to the west. Just as Christianity would move to the west, so did this mother-son cult. And when Alexander the Great established this city, Pergamos, about 330 B.C., it would then ultimately become the headquarters of that mother-son cult, that Babylonian mystery religion. And from here, it would move on to Rome, Italy, where it then would be established as the ultimate headquarters that we see today, and then into the prophetic scenario that's laid out in Revelation chapter 17. But it was Pergamos where the Roman emperors were deified. They were referred to as Pontifus Maximus, later Pontiff and finally Pope. And it was here, the mother-son cult, in the location of the altar or the seat of Satan, would be right here in this particular city. Here in Pergamos, we've now come to the very important location of the mystical gods of the Greek period, Greek mythology. And this is the altar of Zeus who was the father of all the Greek mythical gods. There's a temple that was dedicated to Zeus here, the altar of Zeus in that temple. The statue of Zeus is not actually at this location any longer, but instead in the museum in Germany to be preserved for posterity. But this is evidence of the fact that there was the worship of many gods, and these members of the Church of Pergamos were endeavoring to try to fight off the influence of all of the many different pagan gods here. But ultimately they would be loose, lax, they would fall away from God's true word. One of the reasons that uh, when Jesus Christ gave that letter to John to deliver to Pergamos, he referred to himself as the one who speaks with the sharp two-edged sword by sticking to the word of God. They would have been solid, they would have been stable and they started to slip away from his command, his directive on what they should be doing from this location, reaching out to Asia Minor and winning many people to Christ. Ultimately, he is going to give them as a promise, a prophetic promise at the end of the letter, the manna that is from heaven, the manna that is his word. And so this altar of Zeus is tangible evidence that indeed Pergamos was the throne of Satan, the seat of Satan, here in one of the seven churches in Asia Minor. We're about halfway through our journey to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Now uh, you notice this is not an archaeological site. We're just outside of the location referred to in the scriptures as Thyatira. Well, go there and you'll see there are very little remains, just a small section that takes us back in history, 2,000 years, to the church that was here in Thyatira. But you may notice I've stopped for lunch. Halfway through, we need to spend a few moments getting some refreshment and strength for the rest of our journey. I've got my Bible here. and Let me get a drink of water. You can see that we're... Uh, by the noise of the traffic uh, to my left uh, outside the restaurant would be the highway going into Thyatira, excuse me. And on a dry, warm day, uh, we're going to stop for a bit of refreshment. As, as I think about the letter to the church of Thyatira, some very interesting information here. We were talking about a church uh, that basically was lawless as we look at the church of Thyatira in the second chapter of the book of Revelation. We go to verse 18 where it says, And unto the church in Thyatira write these things, saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like a flame of fire, 
and his feet like fine brass. Now that's a description of Jesus Christ in chapter one. But it's telling the church of Thyatira there's going to be judgment that will come upon them. Their lawlessness is going to call for judgment. Eyes like flames of fire. X-ray vision. The Lord sees all that's going on. Feet like brass burned in the furnace. That's depicting judgment. And there's going to be judgment on this church. It's a lawless church. It's a church that's moved away from the Word of God. And one of the problems is in the church of Thyatira is a lady who claimed that she had the gift of prophecy. Jezebel is how she's referred to, and I'm not sure if that was actually her name, but that would refer back to Jezebel in the Old Testament in 1 Kings, where it talked about Ahab, who was actually the worst of all the kings of Israel. But his wife Jezebel was worse than him. Uh, she had the prophets of Baal that she protected and took care of there in Jezreel, one of the cities in the Jezreel Valley. But she really was the controlling factor in that family between Ahab and Jezebel. And that's what's happening here in the church of Thyatira. What's taking place is she has started to teach and she's teaching and seducing these people to move into sexual immorality and the eating of the meats that had been offered to idols. And this refers back to what was taking place also in Pergamos. And there's similarities not only between unto the letter at the church at Thyatira and to the angel, etc. All of those different similarities we talked about. There were similarities in the worship of Satan, allowing Satan to teach. In fact, it even talks about here in verse 24 that they go into the depths of the study of Satan and the control of Satan here. The Lord is going to have to exhort this church, though they seem like that they were being an effective witness in this area. By the way, the area from where Lydia came, you remember in Acts chapter 16 when Paul went into Philippi, he met with Lydia there. She was the seller of fine purple garments and things. Well, Thyatira is the location where they manufactured this purple dye that would be used. I would suggest you read through these verses here, the exhortation, uh, the rebuke to the church of Thyatira and pay close attention as he has given them this letter. He wants them to move away from the satanic activities and the woman teacher in the church who is seducing them. I'm not uh, going to go into all the ramifications of women usurping responsibility for teaching in churches today. First and Second Timothy seem to say that is not the manual for operating a church and it seems to say the same thing and here are the last words of Jesus Christ to the church. I love the way he concludes the letter. He says to him that is an overcomer and you keep my word to the end I will give power over the nations. Now again the prophetic promise or the presentation that Jesus Christ is making about the future in these letters to the seven churches. It's talking about how we'll be ruling and reigning with Christ. It says here, I will give them power over the nations and they shall rule with a rod of iron. And let me just suggest that's not talking about a, an iron piece of trying to bring somebody under submission, but more like the shepherd's staff and he's trying to direct the sheep where they should go and sometimes he has to discipline them and he does that with the hook of the staff or with the staff itself. Even some shepherds in the past would break the leg of the lamb and then throw him over his shoulders as they moved away to another pasture, a greener pasture. So he says that in the end, if we will understand what he's teaching us here, we're going to rule with him in that kingdom to come. And he talks about seeing the morning star. I believe that's referring to the fact that the rapture is going to take place. We're here in chapter 2 of Revelation, chapters 3 and 4 to follow. And this is the period before the rapture of the church. Chapter 3, three more letters to churches here in Asia Minor. Chapter 4 and verse 1, the rapture of the church. John heard, as it were, a trumpet talking with him, which said, come up hither, and he leaves the earth. He leaves the church. He goes into the heavenlies uh, to be with Jesus Christ. And that's what the church, the bride of Christ, Christians will do at the time of the rapture of the church when we see that morning star. We're going to stop by the location that 
all the tour groups will visit as the site for Thyatira in a few moments. I'll have my meal and we'll see you at that site in just a moment. As we make our way from that lovely little roadside restaurant where we stop to have lunch, we enter into the center of Thyatira and what would be the remains of that city in Asia Minor some 2,000 years ago. Of course, we enter the city on one of the Roman roads, and here you would see the original pavement of this Roman road throughout all of Asia Minor. That's how you would travel over the Roman roads. We enter the city, and you can notice that there are very few remains of that thriving city in the first century. I was able to pick up a brochure that told of that ancient city. This brochure gave us some valuable information. As I was walking around the city, I noticed a city marker that had the name Thyatira on it, along with some of the other names, Sardis and Pergamus, and some of the names in the region. This city marker helped us to know that indeed we were in Thyatira. And as you could see, while we traveled just briefly here in the city, not many remains of the thriving city, one of the church cities in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Next, we head off to Sardis, the city of the fifth of the seven churches, who would also receive a letter from Jesus Christ. The columns from the Temple of Artemis, one of the pagan goddesses of pagan religiosity. Here in Sardis, a center for pagan worship. This was the main attraction, and in fact, in the known world here in Asia Minor, all knew of the Temple at Artemis. Compares with the temple there located in Pergamos, the Temple of Zeus the god and the goddess of the pagan religion located here in Asia Minor at the time of the seven churches of Asia Minor. That's the reason Jesus sent a message to each of these seven churches. You're looking at the Acropolis, the upper city here in Sardis. And in our journeys to the seven churches of Asia Minor, Revelation chapters 2 and 3, we come now to Sardis. In a moment, I'll have the cameraman pan the entire surrounding area. It's beautiful. It's very agricultural. In fact, at the time when John would deliver that message, the letter from Jesus Christ to the church at Sardis, this was a major manufacturing center, a major business center. But it was also, at the same time, the headquarters, the center of pagan worship. The columns in the background are the remains of the Temple of Artemis. Now, Artemis would be known, for example, in Ephesus as Diana. But before they moved to naming Artemis Diana, there was a temple dedicated to her here, the center of pagan worship. You might remember that in Pergamos, there was the temple of Zeus, the altar of Zeus, and the father of all Greek mythology, and its gods that would have been worshipped by the pagan people. The church at Pergamos, as here at the church at Sardis, would start to get involved and allow themselves to be influenced by this pagan religiosity, which was in this location. As is the case with all of the letters, Jesus Christ begins with, I know thy works. But then he said something almost at the very beginning of the letter that was negative, which was, but you have a reputation of being alive, but yet you are dead. This is the lifeless church as we go through the seven churches. In the background, you can hear from the minaret, the call to prayer for the Muslim world. In 1453, Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, became an Islamic location. 
and that's still evident today in Turkey with 90% of the population of Turkey being of the Islamic faith. That being a false religion today, very similar to the way it was at the time when the church was actively involved here in Sardis. And I say actively involved, the reputation of being alive, but they were actually dead. How that speaks to us today in some of the churches that we may be a part of or that you know about, churches with a reputation of being alive, but really they're dead. The Lord told them to wake up, to strengthen themselves, to be a dynamic church. And we see that the case was that that did not happen. They continued on as a lifeless church and ultimately they disappeared and ultimately became a part of the Islamic world, the nation of Turkey today. We're going to see that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to promise something very, very interesting to the church here at Sardis. And that would be that if indeed they were overcomers, remember he would use in each of the letters, he that hath an ear let him hear, he that is an overcomer, that defined by 1 John at chapter 5 and verse 4, a born-again believer. And then he says, he that is an overcomer, I will give to wear of white raiment. That speaks of our wedding garment. When we're married to Jesus Christ, after the rapture of the church, after the judgment seat of Christ, and then we put on our wedding garments and we're married to Jesus Christ. But he also makes the statement that he that is an overcomer, I will not blot his name out of the book of life. Now there's some controversy between Bible scholars as to what that actually means. I offer this suggestion as what I believe about the statement. I believe in eternity past, the Lord Jesus Christ put all of our names into the book of life. Everybody that would ever be born had his name written in the book of life. The text says, he who is an overcomer shall not have his name blotted out of the book of life. You cannot lose your salvation, so you could not have gotten saved and then have your name blotted out. From eternity past, every name written in the book of life, the Lord has done everything that needs to be done for us to come to know him as our Lord and Savior. And if we are overcomers, knowing Christ as Lord and Savior, our name will not be blotted out of the book of life. That message coming from a church that had a reputation of being alive, but dead. A wonderful message, and I pray this will be an exhortation to all who read about the church at Sardis. Though you may seem you're alive, you're dead. Wake up, as the Lord said. Strengthen yourself. Stand as a candlestick among all the nations of the world. The gospel message must go out. You must be a part of that movement of Christianity around the world. Well, you find us here in the remains of what they say would be the location of the church at Philadelphia, one of those churches that uh, would be a part of the seven churches of the churches of Asia Minor. We're standing here, you see the umbrella holding above my head. We have a rainy kind of cold, windy day. I'm looking at these beautiful roses here before me and behind me. I believe this would speak of Philadelphia. It was a church that faced a lot of trouble from the synagogue of Satan. Synagogue of Satan would be those Jews at that time in history, 95 AD, who despised the fact that Jesus Christ had claimed to be their king. They rejected him. He turned to the Gentile people as well. And he brought Jews and Gentiles together into what is known as the church. These people would be the ones who would persecute the church at Philadelphia. And of course, the rainy, cloudy, murky day would indicate that that was the case. They would have to deal uh, with uh, the synagogue of Satan. But the Lord, when he introduces the letter to the church at Philadelphia, says, from him that is holy and him that is true, 
talks about Jesus Christ being the faithful witness in chapter 1 of the book of Revelation. And when John saw him in chapter 1 and verse 17, he fell at the feet of Jesus Christ, indicating that Jesus Christ was indeed holy. He never makes a condemnation here to the church in Philadelphia. Only two of the seven churches, Smyrna and Philadelphia, no condemnation, only commendation for what they had been doing. And he talks about having given them an open door. There is an active witness for Jesus Christ even here in Philadelphia today indicative of the fact that the other churches, because they did receive condemnation, because they ultimately did not repent, he took their candlestick away. But in the fact that he gives the church at Philadelphia an open door is such a wonderful statement. It talks about that you of little strength, the church at Philadelphia, only got their strength from standing on the authority of the Word of God and did not deny the name of Jesus Christ. You of little strength, the minority here in Asia Minor, because you stand upon the authority of the Word of God, you're going to reach the majority of the people. An open door I've given you, you are going to go through it. Nobody can shut it. Only I will be able to stop your propagation of the gospel. Another wonderful verse and wonderful promise in chapter 3 and verse 10. He says to the church at Philadelphia, and thus through all of history to the churches and Christians, that you're not going to have to enter into the tribulation period. It says in the text, chapter 3, verse 10, I will keep you from that hour of temptation. I will keep you from that time of testing that terrible time of trouble called the tribulation period. Didn't say he will take them out of the tribulation, keep them from entering in. And what's interesting, the word church is used in the book of Revelation 19 times, all in chapters one, two, and three. In chapter four, we see the rapture. John heard as it were a trumpet talking with him, which said, come up hither. And that would depict the rapture of the church. But the wonderful promise to the church at Philadelphia, I will keep you from that hour of temptation. I will call you up to be with me. And he also told them, make sure they work continually to keep those crowns that they're going to receive. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, I'm ambitious, I'm very ambitious to have the crowns and receive them at the judgment seat of Christ. Those crowns will be cast at the feet of Christ, chapter 4 and verse 10 of the book of Revelation. But chapter 22 and verse 12 says, when Christ comes, he brings those crowns to help us understand our job description for eternity future. All of this given to us right here in the church in Philadelphia, one of the seven churches of Asia Minor in the time of John the Apostle. Part of the greatness of the old Roman Empire was the infrastructure throughout all of the areas, the geographical locations of the Roman Empire, the infrastructure being the Roman road. This is a part of the original Roman road, and it's leading us into the city of Laodicea, the location of one of those seven churches in the book of Revelation. Now, we've started over there in Ephesus. We went up the coastal area, it came to Smyrna, then continuing up the coast we got to Pergamos. We came inland, we crossed over into Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and now coming in to Laodicea. With the birds chirping in the background with the little red poppies all over the place, I can think about the very first time that we came out here with the television crew from Day of Discovery. We went down an old dirt road to get to three columns standing in the middle of this field. In a moment, we're going to reveal what has been going on since 2003 and the excavations that have been taking place with the archaeologists, almost making Laodicea to come alive again. But the letter that Jesus Christ was going to write 
and have delivered by John the Apostle to the church of Laodicea has much to say to us today. Let me uh, walk right this way. We'll make a reveal and then maybe position ourselves so you'll be able to see in the background how the archaeologists are basically making this location come alive. Braining Laodicea into what would be the remnants of a city some 2,000 years ago. Actually, Laodicea was a very wealthy city. It was prone to earthquakes, and several earthquakes destroyed the city, uh, but the city itself had enough wealth to rebuild the city. A church was located here in Laodicea, and as Jesus Christ would come to this location through his letter, Christ, of course, never visited any of the churches of Asia Minor. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle John would have visited these churches. But Christ, through his letter, would send a message to the people in Laodicea. And here, the first thing he would say to them is, I know thy works. You're neither hot nor cold. And then he proceeded to say, I would rather you either be hot or cold. In a moment, we're going to show you the remains of an aqueduct that would have come out of Colossae. The church to the Galatians is located not very far away up in the mountains. And from that vantage point, you can see the snow-covered mountain peaks, which would have melting snows and freezing water put into the aqueduct from Colossae and come down the aqueduct to here in Laodicea so they could receive their cold water. Over in Hierapolis, where they have the saltwater hot springs bubbling up out of the earth, they had another aqueduct. And from there, they would send the hot water through that aqueduct here to Laodicea. By the time the melting snow waters, ice coal, would come here to Laodicea, they would be lukewarm. By the time that hot water coming from the underground hot water springs would arrive via the aqueducts here in Laodicea, that would be lukewarm as well. And that's what the Lord said to the people here in Laodicea and to this particular church. He made this statement that you're neither hot nor cold, you're lukewarm, and thus I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Now think about that just for a moment. Cold, there's nothing wrong with being cold. That's refreshing. A cold drink of cool, delicious water on a hot day would be so good and refresh each and every one of us. How about hot? Well, hot indicates cleansing. You don't take a cold shower, do you? You take a hot shower. I don't know if you're like I am. I love to stand under that hot water coming out of the shower head for a long amount of time. But hot is cleansing. But the Lord was saying to the church at Laodicea, you're neither hot nor cold. Therefore, I spew you out of my mouth. And he begins his message, several other things will bring to your attention, that the Lord had to say to the church at Laodicea. Come with me now and we'll walk along the Roman road into the center of Laodicea. Walking among the excavation that's going on here in Laodicea, Again, I remind you, when we were here the first time, drove up an old dirt road, three columns in the middle of a field, a dry, dusty, windy field. Beautiful red poppies. This day, of course, a bit of rain at Laodicea, as it was there in our visit to Philadelphia. It seems the weather's following us. But this is an example of some of the excavation that is taking place, an extensive excavation, because the Turkish government wants to make certain that people recognize the importance of what was Asia Minor 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ thought the same exact thing because of the movement of the church from Jerusalem to the west here into Turkey, which would be biblical Asia Minor and the seven churches, Laodicea being one of them. There's another phrase that is contained in that letter that Jesus Christ wrote to the people at Laodicea. He says, I stand at the door and knock, and if you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with you and you with me. 
Many use that particular verse in a process of leading somebody to the Lord. In other words, for salvation. I might suggest that verse is talking about service and how when we allow the Lord come into our church. Remember, this was the church at Laodicea. He was outside of the church, knocking, wanting to come in and sup with them. That refers to some type of a meal. Now, a meal is a time of fellowship. The Bible talks about in eternity future, there will be those in the earthly Jerusalem that will eat of the tree of life. And in the new Jerusalem, Revelation 22, 2 talks about eating of the tree of life. I often jokingly say what we're going to do forever is eat. But what that really means is we're going to have fellowship together. Eating is only the process by which we can be gathered together to have fellowship. You don't uh, spell fellowship the way you may think. It's spelled with a four-letter word, F-O-O-D. In other words, you spend time around a meal, around refreshment, whatever, fellowshipping together. That's what the Lord is speaking about when he says, if you hear my voice, I will come in and sup with you and you with me. He wants to fellowship with the church in Laodicea. He wants to fellowship with the church today and be a part of what we are doing to serve him in the time before we go to serve him forever. Here at Laodicea, that message comes true, strong and clear to the church, not only the church at Laodicea, to the church today as well. I have to say that I'm amazed as we've come here to the archeological dig at Laodicea. I don't mean to keep reminding you of the fact that when we first came out here 20 years ago, three columns in an empty field. Now all the archeological discovery that has been made since 2003, in the background, those columns are the Temple A area, according to the archeologist. And that would be the area where temples stood, dating back to the pagan temple, the time when John would deliver that message, that letter from Jesus Christ to the church here in Laodicea. But there is a connection from that letter to this archaeological find of the temple area. The connection is, the Lord says to the church at Laodicea, He that hath an ear, let him hear. He that is an overcomer shall sit on my throne with me in my kingdom, as I sit on my Father's throne in his kingdom. I want to remind you that Jesus Christ does not have a throne upon which he sits as King of kings and Lord of lords in the third heaven. The book of Revelation chapter 4 tells us, and chapter 5 verse 1, that the one seated on that throne is God the Father. God the Father will give Jesus Christ, Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, his dominion, his kingdom. The Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7 says there will be a temple on the Temple Mount in the city of Jerusalem. And Jesus Christ will rule and reign from that temple. That's when he gets his kingdom, that thousand year period of time, the kingdom yet to come, not in operation today, but yet to come. And his promise to those of us who are overcomers, who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, will sit on his throne with him. As the bride of Christ, we'll join the King of kings and Lord of lords and have dominion over the earth during the thousand year millennial kingdom and into eternity future. The church at Laodicea, concluding our journey of the seven churches of Asia Minor and delivering the messages which John would have been responsible for to get to all seven churches, the message from Jesus Christ, the last words of Jesus Christ to the church. We've now come here to the Temple Mount, 
most sacred piece of real estate in all of creation for the Jewish people. And it's also very sacred to the Muslim people. I mention the Muslims because you maybe can hear in the background the shouting, the demonstrations that are going on as Christians and Jews come here to the Temple Mount to just be able to be on this sacred piece of real estate, but to study and to discuss together what's going to happen in the future. Behind me you see that Dome of the Rock. It's not a mosque, it's a commemorative building that was built in 691 AD by Omar. But the Muslim world has now claimed that this piece of real estate, the Temple Mount, and the beautiful building behind us is the third most sacred piece of real estate, Mecca, Medina, and Saudi Arabia, and the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. But I quickly remind you that the word Jerusalem is never used in the Quran. We come here as we think about and go through the process of the manifestation of the church, the messages to the churches, and then the Messiah and the church, the Christians, who will come back with Messiah. After the celebration of the marriage supper of the Lamb, that seven year period of time, while we are in the third heaven, celebrating our marriage to Jesus Christ, we will then mount white horses along with Jesus and come back to the Mount of Olives behind us. And then Jesus Christ will come here and ultimately build his temple, Zechariah chapter six, and verse 12 says he will build the temple. And then in verse 13, it says, he will rule and reign from that spot. In that letter to Laodicea, one of the promises, the prophetic promise that the Lord gave the people in the church at Laodicea was that in that time, we would sit on his throne with him as he sat on the Father's throne. In the third heaven, Jesus Christ would have been at the right hand of the Father, and he was there until he comes back here to Jerusalem, and God the Father then gives him his kingdom. And you and I, as his bride, the queen, since he's the king, will have the privilege and opportunity of sitting on the throne with Jesus Christ as we rule and reign with Christ throughout eternity future. This, the very sacred piece of real estate, the Temple Mount in the city of Jerusalem, by the way, the original site for the Garden of Eden, what Jesus started with creation 6,000 years ago, has made complete circle, and he will rule and reign from that spot, the center of the Garden of Eden, under that dome of the rock, that foundation stone, where he created the entire world from this location, a very sacred piece of real estate, and you and I have the privilege and honor of ruling and reigning with him on his throne from this site forever. As you could tell by the Muslim demonstrations on the Temple Mount, as I was standing before the Dome of the Rock, the location where Jesus will rule and reign with us forever, there is going to be contention, a controversy, a conflict, over the Temple Mount, the most sacred piece of real estate in all of creation. On this documentary, we've looked at the manifestation of the church, the church starting in Jerusalem some 2,000 years ago, and then moving to the west into Asia Minor at that time in history. There we saw the messages that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to seven local churches there in Asia Minor all of them with a personal application, a practical exhortation, and a prophetic presentation. These seven letters to the seven churches in modern-day Turkey today still speak to us after these 2,000 years, and we must heed the message that the Lord Jesus has given to the churches today through the apostle John the Revelator. In those letters, we see that to the church in Thyatira, the Lord promised that we would rule the nations with him. The church in Philadelphia told us that we would be a pillar in the temple of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that he will build when he returns. Even that lukewarm church, Laodicea, received the promise that we would sit on the throne of Jesus Christ on this earth in the city of Jerusalem when he does return. But remember that's in the future. 
before all of these promises are fulfilled, the rapture of the church takes place. And that was promised to us in the letter to Thyatira when he talked about we would receive the morning star, Jesus Christ. It is after the rapture when all of these prophecies will be fulfilled. They are fulfilled for you and for me if we are prepared for that time. How is preparation made? Well, it's as simple as ABC. You need to admit that you're a sinner. You cannot keep the standard that God gave, but God did provide a provision so that we could be prepared. He sent his only begotten son that whomsoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You have to believe that Jesus died to take away our sins. He resurrected from the dead to prove that he was qualified to take away our sins. And then you need to call upon him to be your Lord and Savior. You can see that preparation is as simple as A, admit we're sinners, B, believe that Jesus Christ can save us, and then C, to call upon him. Now, if we are prepared for Jesus Christ to take us at the rapture of the church, until that time, we need to live pure lives in light of the fact that we have this hope within us, and we need to be productive until he does call us to be with him. You know, having said everything I've just said, the next event on God's calendar of activities is the rapture. Not one prophecy must be fulfilled. That rapture could actually happen today. So let's keep looking up until.